Are you familiar with the game Overrated Underrated? Like, moving out of New York. <laughs> overrated. Picaditas. Underrated. I can't believe nobody's talking about the superfood. Solo travel. Correctly rated. Anyway, what if we did this for drum advice? As in, if I asked you to name the most overrated bits of advice everybody gives. Even if it's correct advice. But it's just such a cliche it does not need more airtime. Rudiments. Important, but we've heard about them to death. Disclaimer. I love rudiments. Four-way coordination and coordination exercises. Nobody's saying, hang on, you need coordination to play the drums? And even though I still think it's widely misunderstood, pocket and groove. Not underrepresented in the drum advice canon. Even my pet hobby horse, time or timing. My only, my precious, not underrated. Tons of drummers will talk to you about time. But what if I told you there was a category of super important stuff nobody's talking about. Like stuff that if you're following all the conventional advice and you learn this, you're like, what? How come nobody mentioned this before? And what if I told you that even some famous drummers, drummers you've seen on YouTube or even listened to on albums, get some of this stuff wrong? Well, today I'm going to go over the top five secret drum essentials nobody's talking about. Can you check the box in any of these key skills? Stay tuned. Essential one, kick and rim shot consistency. Yeah, didn't see that one coming, did you? This is one you might not be familiar with if you haven't done much recording. When I was still in college, my old teacher told me a story about one of his first recording sessions. How he had chops for days, how he knew the music cold, but how they spent an entire day on just the drum part for one song because the engineer wanted all the kick notes the same volume. And my teacher hadn't been prepared for that. I noticed it sometimes playing with the EAD, especially with the triggers turned up. Like, in this recording, my snare room shots weren't a consistent volume. It's not something you'd necessarily think about just playing live. Partly because you hear more stuff in a recording, but mainly because a lot of us just aren't used to listening to the way we really sound in real time. We play and we have a fantasy sound in our heads about what we think we sound like. Here's another spot where I struggled with this recently. Where Matt Halpern switches to the double kick in this clip, I was trying to cover subdivisions and the volume of my kick went down. So the most important way to practice this is changing surfaces and subdivisions. Say you're laying down a beat playing eighth notes on the hats. Then you switch to the ride cymbal and start playing with the left foot. Classic time for the volume of the kick and snare to change. Don't let it. Practice keeping the volume exactly the same. Another one is when you're changing subdivisions. Let's take my periphery example. When I played the broken hi-hat pattern, it was easy for me to keep my kick and snare at the same volume. But when I started playing more constant 16ths on the hat of the right, I had to struggle more for those voices to still come out. When I think about a real pro when it comes to this stuff, I think about Calvin Rogers. One of the underrated things about Calvin is how consistent his drum sound is, no matter what he's playing and no matter the acoustic environment. And I won't name them, but now that you have this in your head, you're likely to notice some name drummers who aren't as consistent as Calvin. Anyway, let's move it along. Essential number two, Masakote. Most of you haven't heard these from me yet, right? Oh, 80-20 is just going to make the same lesson every time. Nope, I've gone deep digging for you guys. Bringing you the next every week. So let's check Urban Dictionary for the definition of Masakote. Whoa, I was not expecting definition one there. It's definition two, guys. Definition two.
In mambo and other Afro-Cuban styles, masacote is the matrix of rhythms, the drums, and the other instruments create. The percussion instrument to be sure, but in my estimation also things like the bass, the piano, and even the horns. Everybody's locked into this matrix. So what does this mean when we're playing the drums? Well, it's loosely related to feel and groove. Like, blades hook up with Sam Yehel, the organist, and the momentum they create in this tune is magical. Part of it's the drums themselves. And part of it is the lockup between players. But I've talked to you about that before. What I want to talk to you about this time is why you can transcribe Justin Tyson. And it still doesn't sound like Justin Tyson. Or why we can try to play what Annika plays. But it still doesn't sound like Annika. Part of that is another thing I'll get into later in the lesson. But a big part of it is Masakote. By which I mean consistency in the subdivisions. An easy way to see if your subdivisions are slop is just to chop. And slow down what you're doing to painfully slow. Ideally, what you'd like is for your ghost notes to all be one volume and within a single subdivision for the distance between them to be consistent. Then when you speed it up again, it sounds more like those guys we all listen to and love, right? Now, I know one critique I'll get is, but Nate, what about intentionally nasty drumming? And that's true. There are some great drummers whose subdivisions are intentionally sloppy in kind of a nasty way. But look in the mirror. Are you nasty like a samba school in Rio? Or are you suburban nasty? Can't really dance nasty. I'll leave that to you. By the way, this is a pretty easy one to fix, and if you're interested in a free resource that'll help you, just click below the player, enter your email in on the next page, and I'll every time! So, two down, and how many people have you heard talking about this stuff? Practice your chops, bro, four-way coordination, etc. By the way, another one's keeping your place in the music, but I'm not gonna talk about that here. Know why? Because I already covered it in another video. But let's move on to yet another new one. Essential three, intention. Yeah, didn't see that one coming either, did you? Now, when I say intention, I'm not talking about anything new agey. Wow, she she. I'm talking about something super tangible. I was watching a clip of a well-known drummer who I won't name do a sound check before a gig a few years back, and it occurred to me, he's just hitting stuff. Like, just because the symbol is there. An underrated skill behind the drums is not being surprised by any sounds. It's a subtle one, and later on I'll show you how to really discern this, but just listen to Justin Tyson here. Listen to Nate Wood in this excerpt. If you wrote down what either of them played in a score, it would be exquisitely orchestrated. Some drummers, however, sound like somebody just spilled ink on the score. I remember making a conscious decision about a decade ago that I wasn't going to play any more bullshit. Bullshit, as I define it here, is when you're kind of just swinging drumsticks at objects and you're not really sure what's going to come out. In most scenarios, great players are hearing what they're going to play in their heads at the same time they're playing it. Like, here's an experiment to illustrate. 
play a lick or fill, but instead of actually hitting the drums, stop your sticks before they make any sound. Now, sing what your drum or cymbal would have sounded like if you'd hit it. You can even do this at a desk if you picture a drum kit. If it's easy for you to sing the sounds the drums and cymbals would have made, you've got high intentionality. Begin by sitting in a comfortable position. God, I sound like a cult leader. But if you can't, it probably means you're bullshitting at least a little. And if you're looking for a step-by-step -step system to help you play with more intentionality and less bullshit, I recommend my coaching course. For more info, just click below. Okay, I'll save the sales pitches till the end. Anyway, if you've made it this far in this video, it's time to play two of the classics. Essential number four, playing clean. And yes, this is one I've mentioned before. So you're creating that masakote by nailing all your subdivisions. And you're hearing everything you play as you play it, so that even if you took the drumsticks away, you could still mostly sing the sounds the drums would make if you hit them. There's another link in this chain, which is the real version of what's commonly called coordination. Most coordination teaching gets us all wrong because of the mental model that your four limbs are like four different countries all doing their own thing. They've decided to emphasize the fact that your limbs are doing different things. instead of how cleanly they're playing together. So I'd approach this differently than most teachers. If you think the efficient frontier is how many different things you can do at once, you'll probably go in for some kind of new breed based coordination bonanza. Except in many cases, especially when I walk by different people's practice rooms, a lot of it's not really locking up. If, like me, you think the efficient frontier is whether you sound like a high school drumline or the Blue Devils, you're probably going to practice much simpler stuff until you can nail it. Like the humble rock beat, making sure the kick, snare, and hats all occur at the same time. Or common pitfalls like the 16 note pickup to the downbeat with the kick co-occurring with the galang of spangalang with the lead hand. Eventually, you'd add hats with the left foot, making sure everything was still super clean. If you start with the fundamentals and work up to the crazy coordination stuff people like my friend Colin Hinton play effortlessly, you'll be in a much better spot. And this is exactly the type of thing I show you in my coaching course. More info if you click below the Anyway, and number five is another classic, but I've never presented it in this context before. And it's useful to think of these as constituting kind of a grand unified theory. Put them together and all of a sudden you start sounding better than everyone who's never taken them into account. Disclaimer. Once again, I'm not saying don't play rudiments or work on your foot speed. Only that everybody talks about that constantly. And that this stuff is just as important, but hardly anybody mentions it ever. Except number five. I can't take credit for number five. I gotta give big ups to David Cola. Essential five. Practice a big range of dynamics. Okay, so play with dynamics is not underrated advice. Everybody and their dad loves to weigh in about dynamics. I have dynamics, dynamics, dynamics constantly in all my comments. What everybody misses though is that if you don't practice dynamics, you're not gonna be very efficient at playing them on a gig. And the other thing is our practice room can kind of lull us into this mezzo forte, which just means medium volume for those of you who didn't go to music school. It's super easy to hear and hear, and we don't want to blow our eardrums out by playing anything too loud, so we kind of just play everything medium. But David Cola has an entreaty for us when it comes to the top end of the dynamic range. If you want to sound like Aaron Spears, you need to hit like Aaron Spears. <laughs> and I've covered this before, but this is reason two why if you're trying to sound like Justin Tyson and you're doing everything he's doing from a transcription perspective and you're still not sounding like him. Reason number one we covered before is the Masakote, the subdivisions. But reason two is the volume. Look at his stick height here.
Do you ever practice hitting that hard? My pet theory about this is that a lot of the modern shoppers played in church. So they were constantly getting auditory reminders to project and to play clearly. But we can simulate this in the practice room by just remembering to practice loud. The other end of the dynamic range is equally neglected, especially if you come from a rock background. What I recommend for that is to play along with some soft music. Maybe jazz, like a vocal trio with no drums. Or some kind of acoustic folk music. In other words, give yourself auditory cues that you have to lower your volume level to match the music. Got it? So there you have it. Five secret drum essentials nobody's talking about. Anyway, if you've enjoyed this lesson, and you've heard me hinting throughout that I might have something that will take you deeper into the matrix, deeper into learning to play within the matrix, I recommend you check out my course, The Coaching Course, which is like three to six months of studying with me for around the price of a single lesson. But I'm not gonna make you vault up to that ledge in a single step. Instead, I'm gonna coax you bit by bit into my funnel. I'm gonna invite you into a pleasantly temperatured boiling pot and turn up the heat increment by increment. And to start that process, I recommend you click below the player and enter your email address in on the next page. You'll be subscribed to my free email list upon which I'll send you three free videos within the next three weeks that'll make your playing better than it's gotten in the last six months. There's no obligation to buy anything ever. I'll also send you all of my free lessons as soon as they're released so you'll never miss a thing. And if you want, you'll have an opportunity to sign up for the coaching course. We only open that a few times a year. That worked for GDPR. Anyway guys, had a great time as always. Check you here next week. Peace. Oh, and that's how you get the gig.